All right, we're live and we're rolling. Welcome to The Real Venture. I'm your host, Peyton Truitt, joined as always by my co-host, Luke. And Luke and I are starting a new business together. So in order to succeed in it, we developed this podcast as a platform to ask other successful entrepreneurs the exact questions that we think we need the answers to. So if you're in our shoes, but you're not sure what the next step is, then The Real Venture is the place for you. Welcome. Dude, we're, we're live and we're rolling. All right. Well, so today we don't have uh, a guest, but instead what we're going to do um, is kind of talk through our new strategy for how we're going to interview guests. We've had a kind of a lot of really cool interviews, but we felt like there wasn't a lot of consistency between them and there wasn't a lot of uh, strategy to how we were kind of learning about their lives and their businesses. Um, and so uh, we've kind of prepared a list of questions that we think is going to help us drill into that. Um, and we figured today uh, we could go through that with you, uh, kind of explain our reasoning for why we decided on those questions and answer a few of them ourselves. So, um, yeah. And, you know, I think, I think the other, the other really important thing and the reason that, you know, we're setting up these questions is, is like the whole point of this entire podcast was to ask questions that we wanted to know the answers to, to help our business, you know, move forward and, and improve. Yep. And we think that this new format will cons you know because these are the questions we want to know the answers to will help us consistently get more answers for ourselves but also in turn provide better answers and better content for you the listeners yeah exactly and so um there there's you know kind of way too many questions that we could ask uh so we kind of had to cut out a lot of um the ones that we thought were interesting and really the goal with all of this is just to help us kind of get to the kind of the, the core things that we're interested in and then kind of drill into it further in the in the interviews however that goes um but uh but yeah let's let's kind of go through them so peyton uh what are kind of like the first few uh questions that we had uh we had on the list yeah. So the first, the first three are actually extremely important questions because it gives us all of the background information on the guest. Um, so, you know, we want to ask, you know, the typical, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, start building that, that personal connection with the guest and then moving into what they actually do in a business setting. So, you know, what their business is, um, you know, what the business does, uh, how it adds value, uh, questions or, you know, stories and questions around that. And then we kind of start transitioning into some more, you know, personal day to day things. And, you know, that brings us to the third question, which is walk us through a typical day in the life. And we think that this is going to be a really cool question because, you know, we're going to be able to see, you know, exactly, you know, how they, how they move through their business day. Um, you know, what's important to them, how they prioritize. Um, but then, you know, also at home, it, it, it's a great question because, you know, you can see how these successful people structure their days and, you know, you can start to, to take things away from that and, you know, start, you know, putting together and scheduling yeah, your days. Cool. Um, you know, if you, if you have, and a I mean, I think it's always a confusing thing. Like people don't really, like if you're a, you know, you're, you're working as like a, a salesperson at a, you know, big tech company no specific names in mind, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, kind of like perceived what you do in a day is a little bit more straightforward, right? Like you're kind of, you, you have kind of like a few set things you need to do. Um, but a lot of the people we're talking to don't really have necessarily like a prescribed set of things that they do. And, um, it's always confusing, I think for, for people who haven't done it to look at them and be like, Oh, like, what do you actually spend your, 12 hours, 14 hours a day, uh, that you're working on something doing like, well, who are you calling people? Are you like, you know, coding? Are you, uh, reading? Are you whatever? Right. Um, and I think that, uh, it would be really interesting to get that because especially from the people we've talked to so far, right. Ranging from Krish, uh, to Opie to, um, you know, a, a lot of these other folks, uh, it's been kind of like very diverse types of work that, that they're doing. And it'll be fun for, for us and, and everybody else to kind of see how that, uh, that fits together. And, and I think the other really cool thing is, you know, you're going to find out that all of these successful people, I mean, they, they work really, really hard, but like, it's not like balls to the wall for 16 hours straight. Right. You know, I mean, like, I think that that's something that's kind of misconstrued is, I mean, there's, you know, you have to work in some other important things like reading and taking time for yourself and, and some things like that. So it's going to be cool to see, you know, how all these successful people work those things into their schedules as well. Yeah, for sure. And so then, and then we get into a little bit more of the, um, uh, kind of like life questions, like how did you kind of get to the point you are today stuff? So the first one, um, you know, very, very generic kind of, uh, you know, your, your grandma might ask you this or something, but what did you want to be when you were 12 years old? Um, and I, I kind of am curious, Peyton, uh, what did you want to do when you were 12 years old? 
Well, what I wanted to do when I was 12, I still want to do today at 24 is I want to be like an astronaut or a pilot. I think that that is so incredibly cool. Um, you know, growing up, we always used to, to go to the airport and just like, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to grow up in a, in a small town and we, and we had an airport and um, because Purdue was there, the flight school was really big. So planes were flying in and out all the time. And, you know, we would just go watch the planes. And I always, you know, dreamed of, of getting to do that. But unfortunately, I have absolutely horrible eyes. Um, so like legally, I don't think even with LASIK, I could ever be a pilot. So I don't think that dream will ever come true, which is sad, <laughs> but, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a tough, Aren't you a little boy, big to but, be a pilot too. I feel like, you yeah, must... I, I, I would not fit. I'm six, five. I do not fit. And I mean, I, I don't even fit on a plane a normal comfortably, plane. <laughs> like as a, as a passenger, I couldn't imagine being in, in the cockpit. Um, what about you, Luke? What did, what did you want to be when you were 12? Um, well, to be honest, I was not really thinking about what I wanted to be doing, unfortunately. But um, uh, the main thing I remember when I was uh, about that age, I was really into dinosaurs and like history and all that stuff. And uh, I had wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, I don't remember if it was when I was 12 or not, but I remember paleontology being like this really exciting thing to me. Um, but you know, as you get older, you kind of realize like, wow, like that sounds boring as hell. Like I don't actually want to do that. Um, but, uh, but it, that was like, yeah, I would read books about dinosaurs, like all the old animal. History. What's your favorite dino? Uh, the, the, I don't know if you've seen uh, Jurassic park three, but, um, the Spinosaurus, I always like to yeah. me, it was always like this battle of like all the big, uh, carnivore dinosaurs. Um, and like those were the ones, you know, I was like, you know, I was like, ah, oh, like carnivores, that's you know, that's the thing to be. Um, and, uh, and to me, the Spinosaurus was like the one that could just knock out all the other carnivores. So be beat the T-Rex, beat the Albertosaurus, all that stuff. And, uh, look at you name dropping these dinos out yeah, here. Yeah. I just need to make sure everybody knows that I know my stuff. Um, <laughs> so come at me. I've, uh, I've done my paleontology research, um, but I don't want to be yeah. that anymore as I guess I'll say that's not really on my list of things to do in my life. You don't, you don't want to go sit out in the desert and brush rocks, use a paint and brush rocks. No. And use a, yeah. Use a paintbrush. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Uh, I don't blame so, you. So, so I guess I like then kind of transitioning from that in our minds, the next best thing is to say, okay, this is what you wanted to do when you were a kid. Um, kind of how did you go from, uh, you know, being a kid, you know, high school, all that stuff to where you are today. So we're saying, what are three major milestones that kind of set your direction to get you um, to where you are now? Uh, and I think it would also be interesting if we answered that as well. Um, Peyton, can you think about that for yourself? Like, do you have three major milestones that clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, th um, so my, my major milestone in, in high school, um, my, my sophomore year, I, I was about 210 pounds and I, I was, I was six, four and I had dreams of playing tight end. It's all I wanted to do. Right. Because being an offensive lineman, super lame. Um, but unfortunately I snapped my leg in half, uh, mm. sophomore year at a, at a basketball camp Dang. and, uh, you know, I missed my entire sophomore uh, football season. It was, it was heartbreaking. And, you know, I kind of made the decision that, Hey, you know, this, this could be a, a blessing. This is not the worst case, you know, end of the world kind of situation. And, you know, I worked really hard and I, you know, put on a ton of weight, um, both good and, and bad, but I basically came out of all of this as a, you know, six, five, 300 pound offensive lineman. And it's what led me to, to, you know, get my full scholarship and, and go play football in college. So that definitely was a major milestone and it completely shifted my entire life. So shout out to, shout out to breaking my leg. Um, <laughs> then in, then in college, um, probably the other really important milestone is, um, you know, this fits well with our fail hashtag fail with us. You know, we're trying to get that hashtag going. Um, being completely transparent, I, I got into the business school right off the bat and I absolutely bombed calculus uh, <laughs> twice, actually. And I actually had to leave the business school. I had to I had to move over to the uh, to, to the polytech school. But, you know, and it totally crushed me because, I, you know, I, I wanted to get this business degree um, from from Purdue. And I was, you know, really, really bummed about it. But actually, I moved into to supply chain, which was in our tech school, and I, you know, I, I did really well, and I was actually able to graduate in three years. And then actually, 
was able to finish my master's the next year in the business school. So I basically was able to get back into, you know, my, my business grad school without having to take calculus. So it was actually a, <laughs> a, a, a complete blessing. It was Scheming. awesome. Yeah, I schemed it. I schemed it hard. Uh, you know, I don't know how that's going to look now that this is on tape and it's out there we in the can, universe. But we yes, can skip this part. <laughs> no, I think I think it's fine. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this part's going pretty long. Um, no, it's good. We got to know your life story, man. We got to know the life story. Uh, and then, and, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty early in my career, so I don't I don't know if I have a I don't know if I have a milestone. I mean, I guess the milestone is 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 doing this stuff. Um, you know, this is something that's, that's always interests me, the, the podcast talking to interesting people. And then obviously like what we're doing in real estate, um, too. I mean, it's, I guess that that's my, my new milestone, but you know, we're still, we're still young. So we got, we got a lot ahead of us. Yeah. Uh, what about, what about your milestones, Lukey? Uh, Lukey, come on, man. Um, (laughs) I, uh, I would say the first one, I read a book, um, I think I would have been like 17 or 18, uh, called thank you for being late. Highly recommend the book. Um, but it's essentially was a book about how quickly the world's changing, like why it's changing, what, what, uh, um, you know, to do to kind of accelerate the change, be a part of the change. Um, and it just got me very excited about all things computers. Um, and I had not really thought too much about it, um, before that, but it ended up kind of guiding my direction into, uh, into college. Um, and that kind of got me interested in programming and and which subsequently got me interested in a lot of other things. Uh, and so that I think is the big first one. If I hadn't read that book, I don't think I would have really spent all the time on that. I was very much more like, you know, economics, business, that whole thing. And then uh, computers kind of came out of nowhere. Um, the second big milestone I think was, um, getting my first programming job. Uh, when I was a freshman, I worked at a startup doing, um, kind of some, some full stack web development, which is basically just building like complex web apps, websites. Um, and, uh, and before that I hadn't really done a lot of programming. Um, but doing that just kind of let me know like, okay, this is like very doable. It just takes time, learn it, and then you can kind of do whatever. Um, and that kind of confidence boost led me to kind of do a bunch more projects like that. Um, and then the last, I think the most recent milestone or the one that's kind of set me up for where I, where we are now is, um, I, uh, had started a kind of a business last year, um, that ended up, um, uh, going very well and, uh, exiting the business, um, kind of gave me a little bit of money and a little bit of confidence to, uh, to keep doing it, which led me to raise a little bit of money to work on something now, as well as, um, uh, meet a lot of cool people who have been able to help with, with other projects like, like this. So, um, it was, uh, yeah, very, um, fast acceleration from not caring at all about computers to knowing as much as I think I can know, um, about at least the development side of it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of fun, but, um, like you said, lots more to do. Um, and so then, then I think our next question is, is very fun, which is, um, we want to just kind of know like, like what you think is cool, interesting, who you want to be, um, like, you know, thinking about, which is, uh, the question is if you could have dinner with one person living and one person who's dead now, uh, who would those two people be? You don't have to have them together in the same room. It can be separate one-on-ones, but, um, do you have any that come to mind? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I feel like it's kind of a kind of a cop out, but I think like eating with Ben Franklin would be awesome. Um, he would be he would be my dead person just because I feel like he had such a profound understanding of just how business worked. Um, I mean, the dude like I was I, I forget the exact number, but he basically like started this like um, this trust account and basically set it up for the city of Philadelphia and you know it's 200 years later and Philly's still collecting on it like the the profound understanding of compound interest in the 1700s and and how it still benefits people today I think that that would just be I think that that would just be super cool and then honestly like somebody that's living um you know I kind of want to eat with George Bush Jr. <laughs> W. He does. I think that that, uh, sit with. yeah, I feel like, yeah. And like, I saw a picture of him the other day, you know, dude's like, he's painting. He's kind of a vibe Texas guy, you know, down here with, uh, down here in Austin, or I guess he probably lives in Houston, but, um, you know, I think that that would be a, a cool thing. Cause he's seen so much, you know, he's president for, for a good chunk of time. And, and now he's transitioned to doing other stuff. So my two guys would be, would be Benny Franklin and George W. Bush. The w. What about you? 
The W. W. Um, I don't know. I feel like any answers that I really have to this are just like too like boring. Um, like, like really, I would. I think right now would love to have uh, lunch with Elon Musk, but I think like a hundred million people would too. So. I don't know. If- I mean, I'm, that, I'm not going to lie. That was my first um, first thing that popped in my mind. And I'm like, I can't say that. Yeah. Oops. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, just it, really anybody who has like really gone from zero to 100 in terms of their ability to start a business is something that like I am trying to figure out and always trying to you know talk to people and being able to talk to one of those people who's actually like 100% done it even you know bill gates or jeff Bezos, any of these like crazy like that's great but there's also a lot of smaller names that you don't hear uh what about like gary v gary v for me i mean i would love to have lunch with gary v but that wouldn't probably be my uh one of my top ones i mean although i think he's freaking cool but um i think the uh more in the like on the on the you know, kind of innovative, like on from a tech perspective, being able to kind of take something that's like not known to be possible and figuring out a way to make it not only possible, but profitable is like a, like a crazy thing to do. And so figuring out kind of like what makes those people tick. And so honestly talking to like one of the like biographers or um, people who've kind of like tracked those people for like, you know, there's like a, like for example, oh, Rob Chernow like did like Rockefeller and JP Morgan and like all these people, like maybe talking to Rob Chernow would be would be pretty interesting. Yeah. Um and then dead, you know, like I would also I think it'd be really cool to talk to one of the like the robber barons from, from like, you know, late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. So the the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilt, the um yep. Yeah, no, all those people would be pretty wild because I feel like they the titans of industry, titans of industry. You know, that was a completely different era. Like that's my favorite. Like all the the biographies that I love reading are like House of Morgan, Rockefeller. Like those ones are like really freaking cool. But um, just hearing how they think about things, and also like I also think talking to some of the the people back in um, in like Europe when things were kind of like going crazy in like the 1500s, 1600s, like uh, like Martin Luther, like the guy who like kind of went crazy with the printing press and um, was like one of the first people to really like do something with that, like understanding how like you kind of go about just like changing the way that everybody's uh, everybody's viewing information and all that stuff uh, before the, the internet and stuff, right? It was paper, it was the main thing. And um, talking to somebody like that would be pretty crazy. But yeah, I mean, that was a long-winded way to say there's a lot of people I want to have lunch with. Well, you know, and, you know, we kind of we kind of hit it on the, on the head. And the reason we wanted to talk to these people are because they're successful. Right. And that takes us naturally into our next question where we just point blank want to ask, you know, our guest, what makes you successful? And, you know, this, this could be a combination of a bunch of different things, right? It could be thoughts, habits, their decision-making process, you know, whatever the case may be, it's probably a culmination of, of all of them. Um, but it, you know, it's gonna be really cool to, to, to kind of see how the, these people tick and, and, you know, how they, how they structure everything in order to, to accomplish what they have done. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I mean, I think that obviously it's making the, the assumption that they are already successful, but I think that everybody that we talk to has had success in some way. Maybe they're not, you know, a billionaire yet. Some of them might be soon, hopefully. Uh, but, but they all have done something that, um, you know, it's not easy and they, they had to sacrifice a lot to get to. So um, I think that it'll for sure be a, for sure be a good question, but also the the flip side of that is, is failure. Everybody in this has also certainly failed many times, whether it's a small failure and, you know, they didn't, they screwed up a test in, in high school that really changed them, or it's something a little bit bigger, like screwed up a big deal or, or their first business or something like that. Uh, and it taught them kind of how to get to where they are now. I think no doubt they're, they're going to have a lot of failures, right? Yep. And, and I mean, that's the fun stuff. And that's where this, like, you know, the other thing Luke and I really want to get out of all of this is we want stories, right? Cause that's, it's so enjoyable. And, and I, we think a lot of good stories are going to come from the failures and a lot of really good learning points. Um, you know, obviously like they were able to have takeaways from that, but I think, you know, we will too, just from, from listening. I mean, that's, that's how you learn. Um, the, the next question is actually is, is pretty cool because, um, it's something that you don't really think about. So we want to ask, you know, where is where is your industry headed in the future? And the reason that this question is is so cool is there are so many different things that people do, right? There are so many different industries. 
and you don't know all of them, right? So, you know, we're talking to all these people and we have no idea what the trends are, um, you know, in, in their world. So it's going to be really cool to hear exactly like what they're kind of looking for. And then, you know, on the flip side, tying it into to big global trends that, that we see everywhere at a, at a macro level. So it's going to be a really cool connection, um, you know, between what's going on in their world and, and how it ties into the, to the world at large. Yep. Yeah, no, no doubt. I think this is like one of my favorite, you know, because kind of like these people are like semi experts on whatever it is that they're working on. And so, um, you know, I could read 100 articles from Google or, you know, different newspapers or whatever about this. And I still probably won't have that great of an answer, but they're spending you know, all day, every day working on this stuff. And so if anybody's going to have a good a good take on it, it will be them. Um, from the horse's mouth. And yeah. And so I think I think the other interesting question that we've got we've got for them. Uh, in relation to that is, um, you know, okay, so you've got this industry that you've been specializing in a ton. Um, what would be a different industry that you could start a business up in if you, you know, did you had to sign an NDA, maybe, you know, you, you exit your company, um, you get bought, whatever the case may be, you can't build in the same industry, where do you go? What do you do? Um, and so Peyton, I know we, we have kind of like a lot of random things going on. Um, and maybe our industry is real estate, let's say, um, what is an industry that you know you haven't really been thinking about, but that you would love to start something in? If let's say money is not a you know, right, you've you've been successful, you can fundraise for whatever. You've got you know all the technical talent you need to. You find somebody who's got the technical talent. Is there something crazy that would be um, something you want to spend your time on? Yeah, we're going into Formula One. Formula One, what? Just just straight up, that is my answer. Didn't even have to think about it. Um, I, I don't. I mean, have you seen the Have you seen the Netflix documentary, the Drive to Drive to Survive, or or whatever it's no. called? But I mean, if if you don't know anything about Formula One, it's it's freaking dope. Um, I I'm kind of obsessed with it, and I think it's you know I have absolutely no you know fast driving experience. Didn't grow up driving go karts. Um, but there's like so much money and hype around it. It's it's pretty cool. And then also like living here in Austin, we have the circuit of the Americas, which is like the U S grand prix track. Um, so formula one actually comes here, you know, once every year and it's, uh, it would be a really cool thing to be involved with. Um, really, really expensive though. Yeah. Not, and that's why if money's not an issue, then we're going to the formula one. If money is can you, an can issue, you make then, a real business out of it, like, uh, beyond like, um, like, I guess it would just be like, like what, what, where's the revenue? Like, what do you make money on? So like the, the revenue, so like basically like, I guess I'd have to start a team, right? And so, um, you know, there'd be a ton of, uh, you know, we'd have to design the car, um, you know, that whole entire like building, I think building a car would be really interesting. Um, all the, all the aerodynamics and actually like the, the tech is, is insane because like all those cars are like, I mean, they're super hooked up to, to all the metrics and things and like the, the dudes in the pit are like, you know, monitoring it. They can see how much wears on the tires, um, you know, like fractions of horsepower, stuff like that. So all of that's like super interesting, but all the money comes from sponsorships. Mm. I mean, you can just, you can slap anything on that car. <laughs> um, put a big fig Newton sticker on the windshield. T two, big T two on there. Um, but yeah, no, I think that that would, that would be really cool. And then also like you get to travel the world. Like, I mean, every two weeks they're in a different country driving around in a circle it's pretty cool yes driving what about in you? circles is pretty cool um i think uh one that is like super i don't know um like uh, the main problem the reason i would say that i'm not pursuing this which is uh, the idea is green energy i think generally speaking green energy but more specifically the two kind of specific types of green energy that i think are awesome um are solar and geothermal um, there's a lot of problems with geothermal energy right now. For example, um, uh, if you're able to get deep enough in the ground, you've got this generator of heat called the core of the earth that can just boil water, power anything 24 seven all the time, right? So if you could get deep enough to get that heat that could do that, um, you can kind of go, go crazy with it. The problem is right now. How deep is deep? Um, well, I've seen all kinds of stuff. I don't really know what the right, uh, right number is, but, um, one thing I was saying, reading was saying a hundred miles, you gotta go a hundred miles down. Um, wow. right. Which is, that's very deep, but if you could go that deep, you'd have infinite, not infinite, but you'd have a ton of energy going all the time. Right. Uh, and if you figure out how to drill a hundred mile hole once you can figure out how to do it again, probably. Yeah. Um, so that is that, that, that's really cool to me is, is just the idea of not only in the United States, but around the world, 
finding a way to kind of make all of the energy that everyone's consuming renewable and something that that can kind of be uh sustained without having to the, the pollution part of it of course I, I care about but the main thing to me is this the sustainability 100 years from now fossil fuels aren't going to be uh, a thing right how can we make sure that the entire world's always going to have electricity um to go off of as well as things like you know electric transportation electric um uh you know, consumption in your, in your homes, things like that. And so I think I would love to do that. The reason I haven't thought really much about pursuing that is it's extremely technical, uh, in a way that I have not, you know, learned and I would love to learn about it. But, um, my expertise is more in the, the finance slash, uh, computing stuff. And so that's kind of where I'm focusing my time, but I would love to, uh, to spend some time in that either when I have a little bit more money or a few people to help me. Look at you just changing the world out here. Yeah, one one Formula One car at a time. Um, one Formula One. Car. Maybe you can power my car with geothermal uh, energy. Yeah, you, you should. Or or a really big solar panel on the top. Just a huge. I'm sure that would be horrible for the aerodynamics of the vehicle. But yes. <laughs> but then it would be sustainable. But then it would be sustainable. And you know those things that punch, right? Like those Teslas. Those guys just boom. They take off. Yeah. Um, and then we got a couple last questions here. Um. So this is, so far we've gone through 10 questions, everybody. So we're counting. Um, but now we've got one. Uh, if you're giving the um, commen commencement speech at your college, right? You're talking to a bunch of college students. Uh, what, uh, what are three pieces of advice that you would give to everybody as a part of your speech? And I think, Peyton, the purpose of this question is mostly just to say like, hey, look, like you're talking to a bunch of college students. What, what do you tell them so that they make the most out of their time in college or the time right after college or whatever the case may be? Yeah, because it, it kind of gives them a chance for like reflection, right? You know, like they at one point they were sitting in those seats. Um, so being able to, you know, basically like talk to yourself, it's kind of like the what advice would you give yourself if, you know, your college, your 20 year old self kind of thing. Um, but it's, you know, a little more fun because it's a hypothetical thing. I mean, everybody, um, I mean, I don't know if everybody dreams of giving a commencement speech, but usually when you do, it means you, uh, you did something right. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a cool position, um, a cool position to be in. And, uh, you know, I think that that, you know, we'll leave everybody with some, some good parting wisdom. And then we move into my favorite, yeah, question. Your favorite question. Luke just loves it so much, but just simply, why are you an entrepreneur? I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, you Do know, you? the jury, yeah, jury's still out on that one. Um, no, but I mean, I think it's, you know, at, at the essence of this, of this episode or podcast, you know, it's, I just, we just want to know like why you do business, what, what drives you, why do you do this? And, uh, you know, how do you want to continue doing it? And, you know, it's a pretty open-ended question and I think it just, uh, sets up for some interesting dialogue. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think overall, as much as I hate to admit it, it's a good question, but I just, there's a little part of me that I just can't stand it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's it. So just to real summarize for everybody, again, we're going to start with, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your business? Um, just walking through the typical day in their lives. Then we kind of hop into some questions about their past. So what did you want to be when you were 12? What are three major milestones, um, that led you to where you are today? What is one living and one dead person you'd want to have dinner with? Um, and then we kind of go into more like currently where they're at. So what makes you successful? How has failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Um, where is your industry headed in the future? Uh, and then we kind of go into more like, you know, like higher level stuff about them. So if you could start a business in any industry, but it had to be a different one than what you're in now, what would you do? Um, and then the last kind of questions are more, um, uh, you know, about them. So if you're giving a commencement speech at your college, what are three pieces of advice you'd give to the graduating class? And then why are you an entrepreneur? So um, that is the summary of what we're going to be doing. I think that this will work a lot better. It was a good idea, um, by the, by the team here to, uh, to change it up with that. So, um, yeah, Peyton, any other thoughts here before we close out the questions? No. Yeah, no. Like, like you said, I mean, the whole premise is, is to try new things. And we think that this is going to be a, a new format that, that might work. I'm not, we're not saying that, you know, the previous episodes weren't weren't great but you know we're just trying to to find what creates the best you know experience for for you guys because uh you know at the end of the day that's what's most important and uh you know luke made uh luke made reference to the team and uh we also want to take this moment to to introduce to y'all uh producer cameron so uh cameron. cameron say what's up what's up guys 
There you go. So, uh, Cameron, uh, Cameron's been doing an awesome job, uh, you know, editing all of, all of these episodes, uh, cutting the clips, um, you know, putting out all this, all this content that you guys see on social media. And actually he's, uh, he's hopping on today because, uh, I believe we have some questions, right? Uh, yeah. So the, the, the viewers, the listeners, they do not get what NFTs are guys. Um, can, can we quickly get kind of, kind of, Give a little snippet of, of how NFTs are even valuable in the first place. Uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can do that. I mean, I think the first thing that is important to get with the NFTs, if you don't think that paintings are valuable, like art, then you're never going to believe NFTs are valuable, I think is like the first step. Or like baseball cards, things that are like like very much... Collectibles. Collectibles. If you don't, if you don't understand collectibles or art... NFTs aren't valuable to you. Like it's not going to work, but well, that's not entirely true, but the current use of NFTs, we can talk about other cool things about NFTs later, but in terms of the current use case of them being digital collectibles, if you don't understand the pra practicality or value of real world collectibles, you're not going to understand NFT collectibles. Um, but, uh, but that being said, I think there's a lot of um, interesting utility behind what, everybody in the art community and collectible community has seen with nfts so the biggest one is that they're unique and they're yours like you you you've never before this been able to say that a digital asset is entirely unique to you um you've had let's just say you have a screenshot of something on your computer you have a video a snippet of ron james dunking on your computer dot mp4 file um that dot mp4 file is you know, in some capacity unique to you because it's on your computer, but it's really anybody has the same file, right? There's nothing to say that that file is yours versus anybody else's. Um, and, uh, and and there's nothing to kind of like make it a, a collectible item in the sense that literally anybody can just go into YouTube and download the video and, you know, screen capture a couple seconds of that, right? Um, is that why, is that why watermarks are kind were kind of, was that like the way to, to, best case scenario to like claim ownership over something yeah well because yeah so that's a good that's a good good point so if you have an asset like that that is not like let's say you have a graduation picture or something that that you get and and in that picture it's like covered with the person who took the picture's watermark until you buy it from them that's a, mm -hmm. a great way to to enforce that the problem is once you buy it you can just redistribute it as much as you want right um yeah and you can always keep screen cut screen grabbing and all that stuff but watermarks are an attempt to like not allow people to just straight up copy stuff unless you give them permission to um it's not a perfect mechanism but it's worked well funny thing is i was working on a, a project a little while ago that was like trying to remove watermarks from pictures using machine learning so you just like you can kind of like find a way to piece together what the image should look like under the watermark so that you can get around the watermark <laughs> Um, but anyway, anyway, that's, that's the, um, the kind of the purpose of like this unique thing. So you hear about NFTs being like digital collectibles. What, what happens is your NFT, the ownership of the NFT, that specific copy of it is, uh, is yours and it's recorded on the blockchain, which we can maybe go we, into we need to, later. we need to touch on blockchains too. They don't get blockchains either. They're not, they're not okay. the smartest. Well, then we can go, we can go into blockchain too. But, um, the, uh, you know, your ownership is recorded. Now what that ownership is, is it's saying that this specific copy of that digital asset, a video or a picture or whatever is yours and only yours, but that specific copy is right. Anybody can copy that and they can make their own version of it but it's not that version, right? Right. And that's the same thing with art, right? Like you can re, you can forge art or you can forge a, a baseball card, but it's never the original one. And the difference with physical stuff is like, you either have like some certificate that says it's yours or it's in your house or whatever the case may be. But with digital stuff, it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to have it be tracked in the same way until now. Um, which has made it very exciting because people are like, this is like mine. Like, sure, you can have a screen chat of it and it looks the same, but it's not the same because this one is like registered to me and everybody else can see that I'm the original owner of it. I'm the one who has it. So it was just a way to replicate physical collectibles in a digital way that wasn't really possible before. So that's why everyone's so excited about it is because it was like, oh, like I love collectibles in general. But now anybody can make collectibles and anybody can buy collectibles. Whereas before it was very slow and, you know, you had like, like specific brokers and all this stuff. 
Um, and it was limited in terms of the diversity of things you could make. But now it's literally anything can, can be this, right? You can make some animated video, like like some crypto, whatever you're putting on Instagram, you know, you make one of those things. Of, yeah. We make that an NFT, right? N- nice and easy. Just cost you like 50 bucks or something, right? Um, Which is also kind of like what we want to do with those entrepreneur cards. Yeah. And so um, we're going to start making some NFTs, right? The, the, main, the main negative to it right now is... Um, it's expensive to make them. Um, it can be expensive to make them, but also I definitely, I personally also see the, um, you know, the arguments against NFTs. Like I don't personally think that they're like the coolest thing in the world. Um, I love the idea. I love that people are getting excited about crypto through these NFTs. Um, and, uh, and I see the, the use case, but, um, to me, it's not like the most exciting and, and I see a lot of weaknesses in it, but can you draw the parallel then to um, crypto? And, and so it, it's pretty much the same thing. It's uh, We can now say this one Bitcoin belongs to you. You you have a, a blockchain that says you are the owner. Is that basically how that works? Yeah. So so um, just, just to summarize blockchain, and it's not really like a five minute discussion. So like, you yes. know, forgive me for being like maybe too fast with it or whatever, but um what a blockchain is, is it's a, it's a database. So maybe you've heard this before, maybe you haven't, but it's a database. Um, and essentially what the database tells you, um, is who basically who owns what, or, or a history of things that can tell you who owns what. So it's a history of transactions, just a bunch of, if you think of an Excel sheet, right. Right. That's just got one first column is like who, who sent something. Second column is who received something. And third column is like what they received basically. And you just kind of like can look through that long Excel sheet and say, okay, Peyton paid Luke 10 Bitcoin. Uh, Luke paid. Whoa. A good payday right that there. That is expensive. <laughs> what? That's 10 Bitcoin. That's expensive. Yeah. Well, you, I'm, I'm just very, I, well, right now it's, you know, well, you know, 20% less or 30% less than it was just a little bit ago. So you're, you're looking at this True. as a bargain. Um, there we go. Yeah, you know, that's like Elon Musk accepting Bitcoin for Tesla. He's like, shit, (laughs) like he doesn't price it in Bitcoin, which, you know, then it's okay. But if he did, he said it's one Bitcoin. (laughs) He just lost 20K on every car. Yep. Um, Sheesh. But uh, but yeah, so you've got this long list of right of transactions happening and you can kind of look through that list and say, okay, if Peyton paid Luke 10 and Luke paid Cameron two and Cameron paid Peyton three, you can say, okay, Peyton was minus 10 to Luke and plus three from Cameron. So Peyton has minus seven Bitcoin. Luke had plus 10 from Peyton and minus two to Cameron that Luke has eight Bitcoin. Cameron, you know, I I don't know what I said. I paid you, right? Everyone's got some number of Bitcoin at the end of the day. That's what this long blockchain is. And when you hear like mining and all this stuff, all that those people are doing is just verifying that transactions happen and that they're Mm -hmm. real. Um, And then whenever you're looking and you say, hey, I have 0.2 Bitcoin or whatever you have, right? That is calculated by looking at the sum of all the transactions and saying, okay, at the end of the day, after every transaction has been made, this is how many you're left with. Um, and, uh, and so that is like what the blockchain is. The reason a blockchain is different than an Excel spreadsheet is the mechanism by which you add data to it. So it's not just kind of this freeform thing that you can go into Google sheets and just like start adding stuff to, right? There's a very, uh, mathematical process by which you add data to it. And that's what makes it this like very new and, and cool thing is that it's a very secure process by which you add data to the blockchain. Um, and you know, we could go into detail, but there's like, there, there are many, many ways now that have been invented, uh, for, you know accurately adding data and securely adding data, um, which is which is what makes it cool. So in both cases, though, because there is this like very accurate way and secure way of adding data to a database, and that's how you can register digital collectibles, right? Because before, if you wanted to do something like this, anybody could forge it, you could just say like, oh, no, I have this thing. Oh, no, I have this thing. But now you have like a, a ind- indisputable proof that you're the one who has it because you got added to the blockchain that says you have this thing, right? And it's the same thing with money, right? And that's why you can have this database that keeps track of it all, but with no one person who's kind of like, or one company maintaining it, right? You, everybody's maintaining it because you have this very specific set of rules to add data to it. And because of that, you can have money that is not based on any individual entity. Does that make sense? To somebody. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we, maybe we do an episode entirely about this, right? We're going to have to do a crypto episode. We, we probably should. That will be a great episode for Clips. I'm, Crypto. I'm excited for that. Yeah, I know you're already, Crypto. you're already doing that. Yeah, we'll get it. But, um, you know, guys, that was a, a, a great example of, you know, why 
people should always ask questions. So keep asking us questions, um, you know, across all social media so we can, you know, continue to, to break things down. And when I say we, I mean, Luke, um, especially when it comes to, uh, crypto, yeah, to the crypto <laughs> stuff, big crypto guy. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, hopefully we, we, we cleared some things up there and, uh, you know, also just circling back to the questions one more time, you know, we're, we're excited. If you guys have questions that you want to hear us ask, uh, you know, let us know social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, all that good stuff, hit us up and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll add it into the rotation. Yep. Anything else guys? Nope. Yep. All good. Uh, keep it real, everybody. All right, guys, if you want to continue this discussion, follow us on our social media. Our Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebooks will all be in the description of this episode. Hop on there, shoot us a DM, hit us up with whatever concerns, questions, comments that you guys have. We'd love to uh, to continue to build that community on there. Next, subscribe to wherever you listen, iTunes, Spotify, Google, Amazon, uh, Overcast, you name it, we got it. We also have a YouTube channel now. So hop over there and subscribe to us. All the clips that we post on social media will be there as well, plus uh, you know a couple little extra ones for, uh, for the real fans out there. So we appreciate you guys. Next, please leave a rate and a five-star review. It helps us out tremendously because of you guys' support. We already cracked the top 150 for business and entrepreneur podcasts, and I think that we can crack the top 100 here real soon with your guys' continued support. Lastly, reach out to us if you're a young entrepreneur and you'd like to share your story on the podcast. We'd be more than happy to ask you some questions because we know that it's going to be a great learning experience for us. 